The Google Pixel 6 Pro has been difficult to get ordered with it constantly selling out and shipping times delayed until January in some cases, but should you wait? Well, I've been using this as my daily driver for the past two weeks, and this is my review of Google's new flagship phone. Hey, Swords, I'm Shannon Morse. Welcome to Morse Code. I post a lot of Pixel content on this channel, so if you're into that, subscribe by hitting that fancy little button down below. This right here is my Pixel 6 Pro in sorta sunny, 128 gigs, 12 gigs of RAM. A few weeks ago, you saw me unbox the stormy black version on my channel, which I did trade with another creator for this one. It costs $899, for 128 gigs and increases by $100 for 256 gigs or 512 gigs. 512 is only available in stormy black, 256 is available in white or black. If you want sorta sunny, that one is only available in 128 gigs. I was kind of bummed about that. I want both pretty and prosumer. If they had 512 gigs and sorta sunny, I would definitely buy it. But this one was gifted to me via Team Pixel though, so I have had it since before release day and I've gotten a chance to put it through a ton of testing. But before we dig into this, I wanted to thank today's sponsor, which is Alice. If you are stuck working with old and proprietary data formats, help has arrived and her name is Alice. Alice is like the Rosetta Stone for data. She uses her knowledge knowledge of a wide range of data formats to connect disparate systems and save you time. She can even create automation workflows that include your legacy data, and she can be activated via a conversational UI in Slack or MS Teams. Book a free demo with Mike Dominic, the creator of Alice, by visiting alice.dev today and mentioning the promo code SNUBZY. That's A-L-I-C-E dot D-E-V and mention the promo code SNUBZY. And I want to thank Alice so much for sponsoring this video. The Pixel 6 Pro is a large phone with a 6.7 inch display and it weighs 7.41 ounces. Now that is a little bit lighter than the iPhone 12 Pro Max and the curved edges on this one make it feel very comfortable in hand. It is shiny, it's fingerprinty, which is more noticeable on the stormy black version than it is on the sorta sunny. The G on the back is in this complementary color and the frame on the sides of the casing is metallic. The entire phone is made out of of this alloy frame and covered in Gorilla Glass Victus, including the back, and it looks really premium. Now, I did want to mention I did drop this on a wood floor and it freaked out everybody that was standing there, but it did survive with no scratches and no cracks. So I think it's durable. Cases are fairly dull right now at the moment. There's not a lot to choose from and good quality screen protectors are also kind of tough to come by. It doesn't come with a screen protector pre-installed, so I'm just going to wait to install one on mine. The 6 Pro does include IP68 dust and water resistance as well. On one side, you've got the power button and the volume rocker. They are tactile, they are clicky, and there's a little groove in between them that adds a nice little touch. The SIM card slot is found on the other side, and there's also a USB-C port on the bottom, though wireless charging via Qi is also included. I think the back of the phone is very reminiscent of the Nexus days, back when I was hacking phones on Linux on Hack5, so I am loving the camera bump because of that. It doesn't lay flat on a surface, but it is level, so it doesn't move if you touch it or press down on it, unlike phones with square or rectangle bumps on the back. Now, here are a list of the camera specs. You've got a 50 megapixel main with an f1.85 aperture and 82 degrees field of view. There's also a 12 megapixel ultra wide with an f2.2 aperture at 114 field of view. And there's a 48 megapixel telephoto lens with an f3.5 aperture and 23.5 degrees field of view. This one comes with four times optical zoom and you can also get super res zoom up to 20 times zoom. You will notice it also has a laser detect auto focus sensor and optical image stabilization on the wide and the telephoto. Now I was able to get some great dimly lit photos on Halloween night in my low lit foyer or foyer, however you say it, which still brought out tons of detail in my hair and the fur on my cape without adding any kind of grain or noise to the picture. This photo of my pumpkin was really well balanced, surprisingly, even with that bright LED lit inside the jack-o'-lantern. And while it looks like portrait mode, 
It's actually not. This is the natural aperture that comes from the lens and it looks great. The main lens also captured this charcuterie board with balanced colors and lots of detail and it's honestly making me kind of hungry. Sometimes portraits looked a little bit too processed. So I went into the Photos app and I removed some of the portrait bokeh to make them look more pleasing to the eye, like these of me in front of this tree. Now again, I think these have great HDR, awesome color balance, the saturation isn't overdone and my skin tone is very accurate. Portraits work in low light settings too, like these ones of this adorable doggo and some party foods. And I thought these looked very impressive for night mode. The ultra wide is great at correcting for lens distortion and lots of really crisp detail. This storefront with the pumpkin shows how well it shows detail even in the shadows, like on the brick on the side of the building and on the hay bales. And also here's some other examples as well that I took on the same lens. That telephoto lens is surprisingly good. At four times zoom, there is so much detail to be had. The accuracy of the colors and the lighting do not change between the lenses, which is really nice. So you get the same color accuracy no matter which lens you're taking pictures on. And even though there technically is not a macro lens included on this phone, you can totally use the telephoto and get up close and personal with your subject. And you can get some pretty detailed macro shots. I also took some videos on here and overall, I'm really happy with the output. You can do 30 or 60 FPS 4K videos, no issues with the phone overheating, which was awesome. So this is a video with 4K 60p, walking up a hill, see how the stabilization and the audio sounds, as well as the video. I think it looks pretty good. It's very nice. And you can also do slow-mo 240 FPS. I really, really love the cinematic panning for incredibly smooth panning and video. Some other features include Magic Eraser, which totally works. Yes, you can get better accuracy in Adobe suite of tools, like I do cloning and healing and content to wear all the time for travel photography, but this is super easy to do on mobile and it gives you pretty great results. You can even use Magic Eraser on photos that were taken on other phones. Just just pull them up in the Photos app and then go to town. So I was able to do that on pictures that I took on my iPhone. Motion mode is really interesting. It gives you some pretty cool effects, but I'm not sure that I would use it that often. Now I do have a question for you. Would you like an in-depth video about the camera performance on the Pixel 6 Pro? Any kind of comparisons? Comment down below and let me know what kind of videos you would like to see on the channel. Now on the front, we have a single front-facing camera at 11.1 megapixels with an f2.2 aperture and 94 degrees field of view. Whenever I was taking photos with the selfie camera, the display shows kind of a grainy lens, which was odd, but my photos are totally clear. I thought that was really strange. The wide angle option is awesome for group selfies. Generally, my pictures are very crisp with lots of detail and the colors are rendered accurately. Even video looked good and it sounded really, really nice too. Hi friends, this is a video testing the front facing camera on the Pixel 6 Pro to check out the stabilization on this selfie camera as well as how the audio sounds. How does it look? Let me know. And this is a bright sunny day <laughs> recording at 4K on the front facing camera to see how the audio sounds and see how the video looks as far as stabilization goes while I'm walking around and running around. How's it look? <laughs> what do you guys think? Let me know. Now you can turn off video stabilization in the settings if you don't want to use it, as well as the audio enhancements, which make voices of subjects more clear in noisy environments. But let's move on to the display. So the display is curved along the edges. This is not a concern for me, but it is noted for those of you that don't like curved displays. I don't find myself accidentally hitting the edges much at all. And I like the almost non-existent border bezel I think it makes it look really premium. The adaptive refresh rate hits up to 120 hertz. You can force that rate in the developer settings, but that does increase the battery usage. So keep that in mind if you want 120 hertz all the time. Some folks were experiencing some display stutter when quickly scrolling in apps like Twitter, for example. After the initial phone update and turning on forced refresh rate in those developer settings, I have not seen that stutter again, although I did experience it last week. So I think one or both of those 
fixes solve that issue. Hopefully the screen recording does that justice. I think it is true to its name when it says smooth display. Now I do wish that it got brighter. It is not as bright as my S21 Ultra and there is a high brightness mode that you can enable to hit 840 nits or just about, but it does get really dim. So it looks great whenever I'm in a very, very dark environment. Movies, games, YouTube videos, all of them look awesome on here. It supports HDR and that kind of footage looks really nice especially when you're watching Netflix, for example. It is Quad HD+, Plus. it's an OLED screen, and it is beautifully crisp. I'm very happy with it. Whenever I was listening to audio, the speakers are pretty similar to other phones around this price point too. I do think that it handles bass though fairly well for a phone. You will get the best audio though whenever you wear a pair of headphones. There is no headphone jack, but they do accept Bluetooth 5.2, so a little upgrade there. And when I was using my Pixel Buds A series earbuds, I had zero connection issues, which is also great since the Pixel Bud A series came as a freebie for anybody who pre-ordered the phone. My mom said that I sounded clear on speakerphone calls as well as on the Bluetooth ones too. Now, as far as the connection goes, I have tested it on 5G. I had reasonable speeds, but I expected them to be better. I do want to take this phone out to some better spots around Denver to test this further since my 5G here is not that great, since I suspect that I could get better speeds, which are totally reliant on location, carrier, as well as device. I did not test this in the same location as my Galaxy Z Fold 3, so don't directly compare the two because that would not be a fair comparison. The 6 Pro does include both millimeter wave and sub 6. Now before the initial update, I also had some Wi-Fi connection issues, but those seem to have gone away as well. It would disconnect from my Wi-Fi 6 network here at home, and I would have to manually reconnect it or the speeds would be terribly slow. But again, I think that problem was fixed after the first update. Android 12 on the Pixel 6 Pro does have some issues. A lot of applications have not been updated to work flawlessly with the newest operating system, and I have had some system UI and some application crashes, especially in YouTube Studio, which is ironic given that they're both made by Google. Some of my colleagues in the YouTube space have successfully fixed this by resetting the phone to factory defaults. Everything else that I have tried has not fixed this problem yet, so I will probably have to bite the bullet and do the same, which is going to take me all day. Yes, I have already tried everything Thing that you are about to recommend in the comments, so save the breath because I've already done it. This may be a culprit of just having an early access review unit, especially if you don't see the same problem with the devices released to the general public. Google's Tensor and the Titan M2 chip duo have proved useful and have proved fast. Switching around applications, loading data, automatic translations, the keyboard learning how I spell things, voice to text, and the phone's understanding of proper grammar and punctuation. Wow, all of that processing, so good. It is such a smartphone. But critically, the lacking of face unlock like we had on the 4 and the slower fingerprint sensor have continuously been a drawback for me. An optical sensor like the one you have on here, which just lit up, is going to light up every single time you have to unlock your phone and register your press. It's very bright it has to see your fingerprint. Even if you register your fingerprint twice, which disclaimer, I did register more than one finger, so I can test this, and I registered both of them more than once. And even if you use always on display and turn on increased touch sensitivity in the display settings, it is still an optical sensor. Optical sensors do require you to press down ever so slightly harder and longer for your fingerprint to be registered whenever compared to a Gen 2 ultrasonic sensor, which frankly uses totally different technology. And different optical sensors will work differently because they come from different suppliers and different suppliers work with different brands. So your optical sensor on your current phone may work faster or slower, or it may be more or less accurate than this one. I really want to drive that point home because I got a lot of pushback when I posted a video about this fingerprint sensor from people who just weren't happy that I pointed out that it is slow and less accurate. So I really hope it works for you and I really hope it works well. Buy the phone anyway, try it yourself and let me know how it works out. Now benchmarks have shown that the Tensor chip has very very strong computing power but it is not as great as the other high baller phones for gaming. Although I will add when it comes to GPU performance 
performance at that point, you aren't going to see a huge difference unless you are playing the heavy duty games. So like not Pokemon Go. Even AR in Pokemon Go was totally fine with no buffering and the game loaded super fast. Also Call of Duty was great. So when it comes to those kind of games, you probably aren't going to see a difference. Of course, the more processing you do, the faster your battery is going to die. And the first week that I had this phone, the battery died really fast, but it's adaptive. It learned how I use my phone and holy crap, I am getting a totally different experience now. I am consistently getting over six hours, six hours of screen on time, consistently like every single day. Here's your proof. I screenshotted these day after day after day over the past week. This was a day that I was using maps and I was running errands on 5G for half the day. These other examples that I've shown you, I'm using the camera. I'm working on social posts on Twitter. I'm watching videos on YouTube or researching on the YouTube app. Different apps do affect the battery in different ways as does being on 5G or Wi-Fi. My experience is going to vary from yours because screen on time is never going to be exactly the same, but I have to say it's a good battery. Give it a week. It gets better with time. It is a 4905 milliampere hour battery. It includes fast charging on 30 watts, and you can also do fast wireless charging up to 23 watts on the upcoming Google Pixel Stand Gen 2. You can also do 12 watts on other Qi chargers, and it includes battery share too. I'm really happy with the battery. Everyone keeps saying the battery must be bad, but it's not bad. It's adaptive. Give it a week, give it time. Trust me, it gets better. Now I love of all the cool features built into Android 12 and the Pixel 6 Pro, the automatic blocking of spam calls, the on-screen captioning for phone trees, focus mode while I'm working, so cool. I can also flip the phone upside down to automatically turn on do not disturb. I've been doing that every single time I set this down on my table in front of me while I'm filming this video, it's going on do not disturb, it's so nice. Google Pay has already proved useful. Practically every single store I step into accepts it now. Material U is fancy. It's kind of unique and it's more customizable than I thought it would be. I feel like I was missing out on so much this past year when I tried to use an iPhone daily, which I did. I did that for exactly a year, even though I knew I needed to in order to have a well-rounded understanding of consumer options so I could provide better content so you can make better choices whenever buying these products. I still had Android devices on the side, but I was constantly using an iPhone. Compared to the Pixel 6 Pro, it's kind of a night and day difference. There's so much more that you can do on Android than you can on an iPhone. Now that's not to say I'm hating on the iPhone for anybody out there that loves iPhones. I love their cameras. They're so great. But if you're really into like customizing stuff, Android is the way to go. For $899, this is a solid phone and it is my new daily driver. I intend to use this every single day. I have been incredibly happy with it and I think it's going to continue to get better. Sure, there are some caveats like no face unlock, but honestly, not much. I will be reviewing the Pixel 6 soon as well, so subscribe. Watch my other videos about the Pixel 6 Pro over here. Now if only they would come in stock so folks could buy them.